my esteemed colleague. This is Liz Monaghan. She is an end of life matron. A matron for palliative and end of life care. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Buckinghamshire Healthcare uh, again alongside me. And what we'd like to talk to you about is our uh, and another course that we developed at Bucks, uh, which looked at the transition between acute and end of life care. And I'll hand you over to Liz. Thank you. Okay, so obviously that's not me. Um, um, but the origins of the idea came from a random conversation in the corridor with the, um, uh, the previous uh, nurse consultant for critical care outreach, Liz Dayvaker. And it came about because we were both having a moan, as you do in the corridor when you meet a colleague, about how, um, as a palliative care team, we were getting towed by um, staff on the ward and by junior doctors we really think this patient's really poorly. We really think he should be under palliative care, but actually um, the consultant doesn't think he should be. And and we, we, we can't, you know, we, we can't argue with him, but it's, we're really struggling with this because we actually think this patient is beginning to die and, and we're not having the right conversations. And critical care were getting cold to these patients because the patient had deteriorated and was dying. And critical care were now saying, they're dying, we're not going to take them to ITU, we're not going to do this. And so the critical care outreach team and the consultant from, the, from critical care um, from ITU were the ones having the conversations. So they were the ones that were saying to the family, they're dying rather than us having conversation previously of they're sick enough to die and we need to start preparing for this. So it felt that we were not doing our relatives and our patients the best service that we possibly could. And then we had, we also had another little whinge that the people that come on an end of life uh, care course are the people that are interested in end of life care. So usually they're doing it quite well. And the people that go on your alert courses and your, or your, um, uh, you know, acute intervention courses are interested in that. So they do that quite well. And we talked about the fact that actually what we often have is if, if someone is critically ill and we're going to pull out all the stops, we're comfortable. We know what we need to do. If we've made that decision that a patient is dying and we're not going to do anything and we're just going to do support and we're just going to support the family, we're comfortable. The big bit that we struggle with in, in, in a hospital is that grey area, that, that sort of uncertainty area of whether that patient is going to respond to this treatment or whether they're not. And having those, having those conversations and being able to prepare a family for the worst, but also not taking away all the hope. And so, um, which is now quite scary that we're talking about this course after we've just followed Walter, whatever surname was, I can't remember his surname now, uh, because it was purely that we wanted to do a lot of, of um, um, emphasis on com on communication and those conversations that you're having with people, but not want to make it a communication course. And so, which is why we then approached Bridget and said, do you think we could use simulation in a way that would help us manage a patient from deteriorating to dying and how we could manage that? So we all sat in the room, because that's what you do, isn't it? It's sat in a room with a cup of tea. So we had Liz Day Baker, as I said, a critical care um, consultant nurse at that point. She's now in a much powerful more job now, but bless her. Um, Bridget as um, simulation lead, myself as a matron for palliative end of life care, and also Jenny uh, Russell, who is my end of life um, facilitator. And what we did was we put together a programme that was a mixture of um, lectures, you know, teaching sessions and simulations. And this is just the middle bit because this is the bit that we really wanted to be focusing on. So we did the, you know, let's remember what, um, um, how to recognise a deteriorating patient. We did the first scenario was that deteriorating patient and we finished it on a handover on the phone to act critical care outreach of why you wanted them to come and see this patient. The last scenario of the day was 
the patient is dying and how you're supporting your families and how you're managing the symptoms and, and, and stuff like that. The middle bit of the day, which we felt was the main crux of the, of, of the day, was that managing that uncertainty. And what we did was <clears throat> we had a simulation and we did, we did the, you know, um, critical care not going to take, are we doing, you know, all the stuff that you would have within your clinical practice. And then what we did was the bit, um, I, the thing about simulation, as we all know, it takes a lot of staff. Okay, luckily, I, um, it is now in the palliative care registrar's t um, education within the hospice, because we have a hospice on site, that they have to come and do the session for me. If you can't use your staff, what can you do? So we have, we have the thing where we're managing that uncertainty, we're managing, um, we're, you know, we're having those conversations about antibiotics, do we, don't we, et cetera. And what we do in the second bit is we role play. So we are simulating and we are stopping, asking people what they would like us to say, and then we will start again. And we usually have um, Chris, who is my one of my palliative care um, um, clinical nurse specialists, who is should have been on the stage, seriously, should have been on the stage. He usually plays the relative and then our palliative care registrar will play the doctor who is breaking the news and doing those conversations of, you know, they are, you know, the, the pre-warning and, and taking them down to the fact that actually these patients, that your loved one could die. Um, and so we, that's what I say, so it's a mixture of both. I'll now hand you, because <coughs> I'm going to cough now, hand you over to Bridget because she can do all the technical stuff. Well, I think, as Liz has already mentioned, we, we know that there are a lot of courses already out there that um, uh, included elements of what we wanted to achieve within this course. And although Liz says that I did all the technical stuff, actually, my team and I had quite an easy time with this uh, um, programme because, yes, we did use our high fidelity mannequin for the acute part of the patient's journey, but for the other scenarios that were written about that grey area, uh, middle ground, if we didn't need technology, we didn't use it. Because, you know, nurses and doctors, they're doers. They've got their stethoscope and they've got their blood gas or their ECG and their observation machine. They feel comfortable. but actually, And you can sometimes end up with scenarios going down the acute way, even though what you really want them to do is to focus on the conversations. So... If the scenario needed technology, we used it. If we didn't need monitoring, we used our low fidelity uh, mannequins instead and really focused the learning on, on the learning objectives. Um, I think, again, our um, emphasis was to make sure that staff felt comfortable and uh, we were supported on the first run of the course. Sorry, that picture's a little bit dark. But that's uh, Carolyn Morris, our former chief nurse at Buckinghamshire Healthcare Trust, who was really uh, supportive of this programme and came and opened the first session of the day. Uh, the course was already written for, always, always written for newly qualified nurses and F1s, F2s uh, that are on the wards. Uh, that was our target audience. And the best runs of this course have really been when we've had both of those groups and healthcare assistants within the room. Uh, we, we keep the numbers small and we've been running the course several times now. Obviously, we had to stop for a little while uh, for COVID, but it's back up and running again now. And the best runs of that are really when you've got an interprofessional team uh, joining the day. Oh, over to you again, Miss. Oh, there you go. <laughs> We're playing yo yo, as you can tell. So, um, some of the following on from what we, we were talking about this morning, or what we were hearing this morning, um, obviously the importance of the debrief. Um, and what's been fascinating for me, um, who's quite new to simulation and um, the 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 
the way that you can use it. Um, it it's, it's the discussions that we've managed to get out of the debriefs. Um, there's often when, pay, uh, and, and I know that um, Bridget talked about this before, you know, often when, when the staff come in, they look like rabbits in the headlights when you're talking about um, um, simulation. And then, um, and the first, I think the first a uh, couple of ones we did, we launched straight into the study in, into the study day, and then took them into the um, simulation suite. And we changed that so that we took them into the simulation suite first, and they got to play with the dummies. And I've probably nicked her lines now. I've just realised, but um, they got to play with the dummies, and they got to be comfortable with that. And then we start, and then we would start the day. But some of the discussion things have been brilliant, and this one was fascinating. So we had, as um, um, Bridget said, we had a team at this point, which was uh, doctor, nurse, HCA from an acute, very, very acute part of the hospital, shall we just name that department. Um, and um, deteriorating patient, COPD, really quite breathless. So the Chris, my failed actor, who's the CNS, was talking far too much for being a, 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 a breathless patient. And Jenny, my end of life facilitator, was playing the daughter. So the team were doing a whole load of things and they were, you know, asking for a whole load of things and they were doing all this. Nobody was talking to Jenny. Nobody was talking to Jenny. And so she said, what's happening? And nobody answered, what's happening? Can someone tell me what's happening with my mum? What is going on? And she got louder and she got more uh, noticeable. We've all seen that scenario, haven't we? The staff nurse went, you need to leave. <laughs> Thank you. I was sat in the debrief with the others who went, oh! When they came back, <coughs> I thought, well, let's see how it goes. It was their peers that challenged them on this. And we actually had two doctors that day, and we had, you know, it, which was quite rare, we, often we have one, but we had two. And they, uh, they, they challenged them, why did you do that? And, and the answer we got was, this is what happens. Well, this is what we do in our department. We need to move them. But you have just, you know, this was a lady who was distressed. This was this, that, and the other, blah, blah, blah. And it was a fascinating discussion about, but this is, it was acceptable because this is how we manage it in our department. Now we talked to, you know, as a, as a palliative care nurse and as a critical care nurse, we could spout the research that says, actually, we know that for families, often if they are in the room while they're watching, we know that it helps with their bereavement, we know that it helps with their, their anxiety. But actually, you know, they didn't even, it wasn't even like, ask the HCA to take the, the relative out and stay with her. It was go. And that got to a really, really interesting, you know, as I said, and actually, I've now met these, I've met these, uh, I met the nurse the other week when I was senior nurse, who still looks at me and goes, I don't do it anymore, Liz. I don't kick them out. But they hadn't, it was, they were quite new nurses. They had been assimilated into the practice of that department. And so now they've gone back and they're able to challenge some of that behaviour that we see. It was fascinating. Um, the next one, <clears throat> was looking at the patient and not the speciality. And I think that's often, you know, what people do. If you are a critical care nurse, if you are a palliative care nurse, there are an idea of what you are going to focus on. So, again, we were doing the, the deteriorating patient and it was a COPD man who has had previous admissions. And my question was, do you think we should treat? And I asked, just asked people to put their hands up. So, you know, we had a number of hands went up. Yes, we think we should treat. And one of the hands that went up for the treatment was my palliative care clinical nurse specialist. And when I said, who, okay, who wouldn't treat with the antibiotics, critical care outreach put their hand up. Okay. Now, I think that's, that surprises the, the staff who were on the course because they assumed it'd be the other way. They really assumed we would be saying, no, don't treat, don't treat. This is, you know, but I asked both of them to give their reasons for why. So for Chris, his reason was, um, <laughs> we know that he's been in before and the antibiotics helped. 
may help again. <clears throat> also, the family's not there. But also, we know that sometimes with uh, COPD, the symptoms of breathlessness, the symptoms of um, your respiratory secretions can be made a lot worse with a, over, an overwhelming pneumonia. If we get 24 hours of antibiotics in, we might make their symptoms better. Do you know what I mean? So we weren't saying go go active, but we were saying actually symptom wise it might be better. Whereas Liz, critical care outreach, was going, well, he's got really poor flow, he's got this, he's got that, we're not going to take him to ITU. You know, we should be being honest. So it led to a really, again, I think it led to quite a good discussion about looking at that patient because both of them had looked at them in a different way, but actually not in the way you would expect their specialities to look at them. So that was quite interesting. Um, and then this one, <coughs> this is Chris's speciality. Okay. So this is the subject we were talking about when I get the palliative care registrar to have that conversation with the member of, uh, the, member of the family about the fact that the patient may die. So Chris was playing the, <coughs> playing, playing the um, relative. And Fasana, who was our registrar at that point, was having a beautiful, beautiful conversation with him and was, you know, pre-warning him, doing all the cues that you would expect for, you know. And then he said to her, are you saying that she's going to die? And she said, yes, I'm saying that your mum is sick enough to die. And we don't know whether we are, the next 24 hours is going to tell us whether we're going down, um, whether we're, that's the path that we're taking. And he just put his head down and he stared at the floor and everything went quiet. And Fasana beautifully sat there and held it, just held it until he picked his head up and went, okay, thank you for telling me. And then we moved it on. And the discussion after that was how much people wanted to jump in and how much, when Chris put his head down, they all thought he was crying. Um, but, um, when they put his head down and he went silent, they really wanted to say something. And a couple of the doctors, again, we had some doctors on, a couple of the doctors said they felt they would have wanted to give some hope. But, you know, but let's, let's see what happens. You know, we've still got the antibiotics may still work. Um, and they felt very much that that silence should be filled. And so actually, you know, we were able to show the the beauty that silence can do. Because often patients, relatives, when you're breaking that news to them, need to have a bit of time to um, take it in before they come back. So um, yes, um, that these are the themes that we've had, <clears throat> which just have been brilliant. Thank you, thank you. I know, I talk too much. <clears throat> and then this is just some of the feedback that we've had. And we were very nervous when we started this course because, you know, we we thought people might come on the on the uh, for the deteriorating patient and then think, oh, you know, why do I need that bit and vice versa. But actually, lots of people we've had lots of positive feedback and actually they are very well attended, aren't they? And um, yes, yeah, I think we were particularly um, pleased about the feedback uh, regarding. I can't read it from that. Oh yes. The, the the one on the left there where a lady was very anxious about the sim initially but was really surprised by how much it gave her to think about and she found it very supportive learning a very supportive learning environment and that's really what we very much try to to do that's the culture within our simulation department it's relaxed it's friendly it's informal and there's a lot of laughter there is which is unusual on in end of life situations but which is really welcomed and yeah, I think that if, particip if participants go away with a smile and have had a good experience, then they'll remember those learning points and they'll come back to you for more simulation in the future. So thank you very much. Any questions? Oh, I was going to say, we stood you into silence. Yeah. Yeah. We were actually trying to run a simula uh, simulation in, in my place, Catherine General Hospital. Because uh, we had the lessons learned more of them, we found that uh, delayed DNA CPR, mm -hmm. DNA CPR delaying in case of it was a was top on the list of mm -hmm. incidents. So we were starting the simulation course uh, 
from the similar similar cases, but I was wondering what your exact learning outcomes or victories were because the slide said four outcomes, but there wasn't just see what you were looking at mainly. Was it communication or putting in game features? Two of them at least were around communication, that advanced communication, not just with the family, but also with the rest of the multidisciplinary team. Uh, there was the uh, A to E assessment That's as well in there, uh, but then there was also uh, an objective about how to manage the dying patient, you know, taking away monitoring and those sort of um, things that we do as well. So it was quite varied. We tried to keep the learning outcomes, but mostly around the, com the communication. Have you ever thought of uh, doing it in, uh, in situ, uh, in, in, in a ward setting, or do you have problems with that? I, um, so I think we've had a bit of a, a lull, obviously, because of uh, COVID. Um, I think it would be it. I think I think one of the one of the ways it would be great to develop this would be exactly to have it more ward based. I know within the hospitals, the wards that do this much better than other places, it would be brilliant to be able to target it. So, you know, I know with the, I know as, you know, managing the, the hospital palliative care team, the wards where we have, we, we're still having this conversation and they're the ones that aren't coming on the courses. So, you know, how can we, I think the next step is how can we then um, take it out to the areas where it would make the biggest difference. Yeah, yeah. certainly something for the future. Thank you. We might just have time for one more question. Did, did you have one? I just a quick question. Um, have you been able to build it out in places like geriatrics yet? Just because my background is in like pains, South Cassia, and 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 Cassia, yeah, we do in our peds in situs, sometimes we'll touch on it, but we've never done a full end of life conversation. So, yeah, that's a really good suggestion. Thank okay, you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.